Well, hello, and welcome to The Village Online. We have an amazing program for you today. I'm glad you're with us. First, Mark Conklin is the founder of Every Leader's Journey, and with his wife, Joy, co-founder of Wise Council, Inc. I am proud that they have become a vital part of our village church family, and they really are dear friends to Jane and me. Last year, Kathy Baldock was in town for Matt and Alejandro's wedding. She even stayed over a day to speak at the village church. After church, she had a couple of hours before she had to fly home to Reno, so I asked Mark if he would be willing to interview Kathy for me, and he said, absolutely. Let me say it like this. If you don't yet know Kathy, you will not only know her after watching this interview, but you will love her. She is an author, an LGBT plus advocate, an international speaker, and an educator. And if you find value in conversations like these, we invite you to join us in expanding such important discussions as part of what we're calling the Village 3.0. Your support would greatly help us continue to produce valuable content. So for more information on contributing, please see the details that's on the screen. This is one of two conversations with Mark and Kathy, and it is her moving story about how her life was rocked by divorce and then transformed when she discovered that being gay and Christian is not only possible, but that gay Christians are some of the most lovely followers of Jesus you could ever know. Without further ado, enjoy. I have the opportunity to interview a highly acclaimed, best-selling author, but more importantly, someone who's one of the most courageous and contagious advocates for the LGBTQ plus community and a force for truth and justice that cannot be ignored that any of us have ever known. Kathy Baldock. Kathy, good afternoon. We're fans of your story and your work, and uh, actually, we totally agree with one description someone wrote of you as ballsy. <laughs> That's right, listeners, ballsy, and we're delighted to sit down with you for this conversation. Let's jump in with just an obligatory rehearsal of the facts, if you would. For those of you that don't know you yet or your work. Just a little about your background, if you would, growing up uh, through college and into your early marriage. So I was born in New York City. I am a fourth generation woman born on Manhattan Island. So a lot of, um, I think a lot of the work I have, I do is really associated with the place I grew up and the time I became a young woman. Uh, my mother, I'm the youngest of three. My mother was, my father walked out by the time my mother was 24 with three little kids in a very heavily Irish Catholic neighborhood in Manhattan. And my mother was um, shunned for that within the Catholic Church. At the time, divorce was horrible. I was the only girl in my Catholic school, Good Shepherd in Inwood, New York, 207th Street and Broadway, that didn't have a father. And I watched the way my mother, I wouldn't have had the words to associate it with, with at the time, but the way she was shamed and othered by the church. Um, I knew that she sent us to Catholic school, but she would never go to church because she was excommunicated. And so there was this sense within me that there was something wrong with me and there was something wrong with my family and that God didn't like us. There was something that we did 
that God didn't approve of. I mean, so you slot that in and pick it up 40 years later and you apply it to the LGBTQ movement within the church that there's something about us and we don't really know what it is, but God doesn't like us. So I'm sure that was planted very early on to not understand why you're just living your life and doing the best you can and there's something intrinsically wrong with you. But, you know, that shame came off of my mother. I saw her treated that way and I didn't associate it until later years, but it was certainly part of my upbringing. And the other part is that I um, became a young woman in the 70s. So I was born in 56, 67. Um, I was the first generation of women in the that benefited from the women's rights movement. So I went to high school in 70, college in 74, and the women that came before me did all of this work so that when I stepped into my young women years, there was absolutely no message that I heard, which is really surprising, that I was inferior or that there was something wrong or less about me. It was a very powerful decade for women. And so I, there was nothing that said that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So you combine that with um, a New York City attitude an attitude of being fairly independent as a young child and having to do things for myself. And with um, this attitude as a woman that I can do anything and I'm not less than anybody. So <clears throat> high school in 70 to 74, college in 74, started out in physics because I was really strong in sciences, but I was also strong in the humanities. But I wanted to go into physics and after a semester in physics, when it sounds ridiculous, but I went to Rutgers and they were one of the only three universities in the country that had a nuclear accelerator and I wanted to see it because that's every young woman's dream to see a nuclear accelerator. Well, it was mine. Yeah. So I rode my bike up to the, you know, the, to the building and I said, you know, very cheerfully, I'm here and I'm here to see your accelerator. And they said, you're not a grad student. You can't see it. So I showed them, and I dropped out of physics. And some of the boys I knew, I was also running track, so some of the athletes I knew who were not anywhere near as smart as I was, they were in the engineering school. And so I thought, if they can make it as an engineer, and they're all talking about how much money they're going to make after college, why don't I go out for it? Why don't I try engineering? So I rode my bike right from the accelerator rejection. Crazy story over to administration and changed my major to engineering. So again, I was in a situation where it was almost all men, 2% women. And I think those years strengthened me too because I went head to toe with some very fine minds and I com could compete with them and felt confident and started working in engineering in the late 70s, again in a man's field. So I think all of those things very much empowered me to not be afraid, to ask questions, to stand up for myself, to certainly never feel inferior. And then I got, got married at 27, and I got married in 82, um, was not, had been raised Catholic, but not um, a confession of faith Catholic. Married my husband at the time, would end up being a husband of almost 20 years. And um, our best friends, as it turned out, became born-again Christians. And a year into the marriage, the marriage was falling apart, and I was determined to keep this marriage together because I had been a child of a divorce. Very mm -hmm. common belief. Like, my mother was divorced. I'm never going to get divorced. So I would do anything to keep my marriage together. So both my husband and I became Christians, same evening in a church, um, walked forward, and... Um, and it seems like walking into that evangelical world at the time in the 80s, which were a very interesting time, politically, religiously, you know, all those women of faith conferences were starting, the promise keepers were starting, there was this very distinct um, rhetoric that was going on in the church, how to be a better woman of God, how to be a better man of God, there was all this gender separation going on, 
And so here is this very strong, independent, young woman who never thinks she's less than steps into a belief system that tells me I must be submissive. And I believed it. I believed that that's what God asked of me. So for years, decades, I took that back seat and didn't question things anymore. I think it was probably clearly smart, but I wasn't a, um, I wasn't a thinker. I wasn't thinking about my faith. I just did what I thought was right in the eyes of God. And then my marriage fell apart and I had to think, well, wait a minute, I kept all the rules. But, so keeping all the rules, what was it like in your home? Give us a sense of oh. what was it like on a weekly basis, on a weekend basis? You're keeping all the rules. I am. You're submissive. Mm -hmm. Homeschooling my children, mm -hmm. hosting weekly Bible studies, hosting women's ministries at the church. When any of those women's dinners would come up, everybody would want their unsaved neighbor that was coming to the Christmas event to sit next to me because by dessert time, I would have them. I mean, I had a gift of, I'm, I'm a perfectly born salesperson. Doesn't matter what I'm selling, I can sell it. So selling Jesus was not a problem for me. And um, I did all of those things. Um, I didn't speak up when my husband made really bad decisions and behaved poorly, immorally, unethically. I still kept, I still submitted. I submitted to bad behavior, and one of my big regrets of life is that I, as a mother, a job of a mother is to create safety in a home, and by submitting to unethical, immoral, angry behavior, I expose my children to that. And so those years in evangelicalism, and I'm st I still consider myself an evangelical, a, certainly a Christian, it weakened me. It weakened me in all kinds of ways. As a thinking person, as an independent woman, as a mother, but I thought that was what was expected of me. And it was such a shock that I did everything expected of me, and it fell apart. It shocked me. So I had to think, wait a minute, what else, what of the mechanics have I gotten wrong here? What am I not understanding about this relationship with God? What am I getting wrong? And that caused me to start to think beyond what I was allowed to safely think beyond before. So you survived Y2K, 2000, right? And then in 2001, so in Everything 2001, um, I thought we were on an upswing. I actually believed, I knew that I had a personality that could be a writer or speaker. And I was convinced, absolutely convinced that my ministry would be marriages that come from hell and get saved and get put on the, the fast track. And we would be that couple on the stage encouraging other people in difficult situations to hang on to Jesus and save your marriage convinced. And it falls apart. I mean, so I hang in there and it falls apart. And um, my husband got engaged in a second affair. And that devastated me. And I, um, I, and then he came to me and he said, well, he didn't come to me. I discovered he was looking for a new house at night when I, I was asleep. He was trying to find himself a new place to live without telling me I was even getting a divorce. I had no idea. And um, I so wanted to, now this was not poor theology. I did not, I did not want to be unfaithful to a man that was unfaithful to me, which is an easy course to take when someone's done that to you. And um, I just didn't want to do it because I think people that are in, relationships with me for even not very long, realized that I really do have a, a quality of being intensely loyal. I am very loyal. 
and I did not want to betray a marriage vow, and I did not want to betray my word to God. And so I thought the way I can keep parts of me busy would be first to start hiking every day. And so I started hiking every single day. And that also became a way of where I could talk, um, talk on the trails and cry because my children were 14 and 13 and 14 at the time, and they didn't know their parents were going towards a divorce. And I didn't want to cry. I didn't want to, I didn't want to damage my kids. So I took all my pain and I took it to a trail. And so I would cry on the trail and talk out loud on the trails. And I remember one guy walking down a trail one day. I don't know where the heck he came from, but he had a plastic cup with ice in it. He must have been sitting at the cooler somewhere mm -hmm. near a creek. And um, he walked up and he said to me, I knew someone was up here. I heard someone up here screaming and yelling. And I thought something was wrong. It was me expressing my pain to God every day, you know, saying, I want to do what's right, but this is so hard. And then I also took Italian because I am dreadful at language. I'm real good at English. I am dreadful at foreign languages. So I thought, let's do the most difficult thing you can do for your mind. So I took an Italian class. And the second night of Italian class, I got paired up with the only gay man in class. And on that hiking trail in the same month, same five-week period, I meet up with a lesbian. And she befriends me. And I start to trust her because my church friends were betraying me. You know, prayer requests in a woman's circle sometimes is you might as well put it in the church bulletin. Like Kathy Baldock is struggling in her marriage. Her husband's had an affair. I might as well have stood up on a microphone and said it. And my children didn't even know. So I was trying to keep a lid on things, keep myself loyal, keep my promises to God, and I was in agony. 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 Mm. And so working on healing the mind, healing the body, the soul, the mm. spirit, and uh, honestly, the, just the physical exertion of the hiking, and you became incredibly disciplined at it. Uh, and still today, you're hiking every, every day. day. It yeah. doesn't matter if it's a snowstorm yeah. or raining, I'm out there. But what that allowed, what that questioning of what did I get wrong, I can also be s not so much anymore about some things, but I can also be a person that is so sure about something that if someone had come to me before this crisis in my life and said, Kathy, there's gay people, I would have said, the Bible says. But when I was in that point of saying, what did I get wrong? I got something wrong. And so at that point of saying, something is wrong with this internal thinking, when a gay person comes across your path, two gay people come across your path, I was, two things, I was more willing to say, not maybe I'm wrong about this, but maybe I don't know everything. And the second thing was that pattern of telling someone that there's something wrong with you, but I have the answer. That was stopped in me because how can I export a sureness and a confidence in my faith brings you to all the good things in life when my own Christian marriage was falling apart? How do you export what you do not have? So I had to keep my mouth shut and just do relationship, which I was strong at. So I befriended Tom Durante and Neto Montoya, and they trusted, because I'm a nice person, they trusted me to take me into their individual circles. And then all of a sudden, as this one-party conservative party person, um, and strong evangelical leader, homeschooling mom. We had people at our dining room table once a week. We, we gathered people from lots of places, all Christians, all from our circles. And I go from that to questioning so many things. And now I've got all these gay people in my life where I go into their circles and I'm the only straight person 
at Tom's parties. I'm the only woman and only straight person. I go to Neto's lesbian parties, all the older lesbians, because Neto's 76 now. So all the 60-year-old lesbians that have been, you know, out for a long time and very secure in who they are. And I'm starting to realize that two things. They really are gay from birth. I mean, I'm listening to their stories, which is like, what? And the second thing was that um, their relationships, their love was really love. And I had been told it was lust. And I'm getting around people and I'm seeing the depth of their feelings in these long-term relationships that the community isn't supporting. And somehow they've been together 30 years and it really messed with my sureness. You know, it reminds me, someone once told me that all true learning begins with the creation of dissonance. Oh, yes. We encounter something that is so counter to everything we thought, believed, were taught, and it sounds like whether it was the engaging of your head, your intellect with the Italian, with Tom, or walking the trails, and deciding one day to say, Neto, we've seen one another here several times. I'm going to walk with you for a while. In both places where you went for healing, God met you Isn't, I with thought of a it beautiful that way. person from the LGBT plus community. I hadn't uh, actually thought it in those terms. That is yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. I went there to keep myself on this straight haha, <laughs> and narrow and to, yeah, you're right, to heal. So that dissonance... Gay people showed up. Yeah, that dissonance drew you in. But um, I want to connect back to the engineering at this point in the story because obviously, uh, from what you told us previously, uh, the times you grew up in, the circumstances you grew up in, the election, not just to go to college, but uh, you know what, I'm going to stand up in a man's world here and I want to study engineering. That... Just the tenacious pursuit of the facts. Mm -hmm. What is exacting? What is real? What can be measured? There's a tenacity that comes with that. And it was out there on the trails. And while you're wrestling with this dissonance, that a resolve began to build. Um, and as I understand it, it came out of the context of those new relationships. I... I... Neto is absolutely my ground zero of thinking about, rethinking about these, these things. And she, I am so grateful to the relationship I have with Neto and to this day where those Christian women that were in my life, all of them are gone. Every one that I went to church with in those years, I had... Fri I had women that I went to breakfast with every Friday morning and cumulatively, and we were from different churches all around the same age. There were four of us. And cumulatively, those three friends represented 67 years of relationship for me. And they all walked out and they said it was something minor, but it was really that they felt uncomfortable that I was leading this very public friendship with Neto and all her lesbian friends, because I also, um, I was having parties. I would just call it girl party. It was very simple. Every month I would have girl party at my house. And all of a sudden my girl party started transitioning to, you know, one third lesbian with all of my Christian friends. And this is in the early 2000s. And my Christian friends were getting uncomfortable with what I was doing because marriage equality was starting to be discussed in like San Francisco and places. And my lesbian friends felt safe with me and they were in my home and they started speaking up. And my Christian friends were, some were okay and some were getting uncomfortable. And so at one point, uh, those three very close Christian friends, two um, went through divorce for different reasons. I won't say what they are because there were personal reasons, but so there would be three out of four of us that were going to be single women. 
And here I was publicly hanging out with someone that looked like a lesbian, right? Identified as, had no problem saying, and then there were all lesbians in my house. And those other women were afraid of being labeled lesbian because they were hanging out with me who was being labeled lesbian. And that was the worst thing that could be happening, right? And so they didn't feel comfortable being this close to gay people. So they wanted to dissociate from me. And the closer I got to Neto, the more uncomfortable it got for my friends. And um, they made, it was, it was something that could have been resolved by middle school girls on the playground. And they blew it up and all three in the same month walked out of my life. So my, my husband walks out. My closest Christian friends walk out. It was shocking. And so you're sitting in this dissonance, um, and I'm imagining you there. And somewhere, something clicks inside you, a resolve. So let's be clear. You don't have a child as part of the LGBTQ plus community. Nope. You yourself are not gay, nope. lesbian, and yet nope. you have become one of the most sought after mm -hmm. authorities, encouragers, flaming advocate and ally for those in the LGBTQ plus community. And it was born out of that pain, in all of that dissonance. So when was it that the tenacity inside you, that person who always wanted to dig for more, ask another question, uncover another truth. When did that emerge out of your pain into a conviction to say everything, not some things, not many things, not most things, honestly, everything I have thought, believed, was taught about this community is wrong. Well, for the first several years, my mind was quiet because I thought the gay community wanted nothing to do with church. And then I was sure the church wanted nothing to do with the gay community. So, so I start on this journey in 2001. People think I wake up one day and I like throw a rainbow boa around my neck and I march down some you know rainbow painted street and I'm waving a flag as an advocate it's a very long journey because at the time there were also no resources or very few re no actually almost no resources I was being the nice person to both communities but my friends were very uncomfortable with my uh, willingness to investigate this and only on a civil level not a theological level and then what happened was um, one morning there was a I live in the mountains, big storm, snowstorms happen all the time. And um, I've been a reader of the New York Times since I was 15 years old. And I've always had a subscription as an adult. Um, I'm an avid crossword puzzle person and word games in the New York Times. And, and I love information. I would just read the Times every day. And big snowstorm, the Times didn't get delivered that day to my driveway. So I took my laptop and as I was getting my hair ready for work. I had my laptop on my sink so I could read the times and get ready for work like I normally do. And it happened to be the day that there was an article on the front page of the New York Times about the Gay Christian Network. It was the front page. Justin Lee, who was who the founder of it, he was the quote of the day, you know, just below the fold there and the paper paper quote of the day. And it said, Gay Christian. I had never put those two words together. I didn't know there was such a thing as a gay Christian. I couldn't imagine it. And there it is on the front page. And because I was on my computer, I could click on the links. And when it linked the Gay Christian Network, I could easily click to the site. And I clicked to the site and I thought, well, I'm gonna go to the mission statement because I'm sure and I'm going to tell you the truth. I was sure the mission statement would be like, God, Jesus, sex. Jesus, God, sex. I mean, I was positive I knew what that site would say. It would be 
a validation of sexual behaviors and sticking God and Jesus onto it. That's what I thought it would be. And so I clicked on that site and I read the mission statement. And right there while curling my hair in my bathroom, I started to cry because I thought, I agree with this mission statement. What do I do about this? So I clicked through the site and I happened to notice that there was a conference coming up in Seattle in January, which it was December, December 17th. Conference was like January 7, 8, 9. And I, um, I thought about it. And then that weekend um, went to church. And it was during the time of a lot of immigrant protests in this country where the Hispanic community was marching. That was the year that was happening. And my pastor was the only white pastor in my town that marched with the Hispanic community. And he did a sermon that Sunday on, but he, he knew talking about the Hispanic community by name would send some people out of the church. It would cause them to leave that didn't agree with his stance. So instead of using the word immigrant, he kept saying the other. And every time he said the other, I stuck gay Christians in that the other. Hmm. And I sat in the back of the church and I just kept putting these other people that I had just found out about in his talk. And I cried through the back of the church of the sermon. And at the end, I mean, I was very close with my pastor. And I walked up and he said, something touched you. And I said, this, he, he said, what's going on, Kathy? And I said, there are gay Christians. Like, that's not what he expected me to say. You know, like maybe, you know, my neighbor is brown, but that's not what I said. There are gay Christians. And he said, okay, what do you want me to do about it? <clears throat> I said, well, there's a conference in Seattle next month. And I don't, you know, I know as a Christian woman, my covering is my pastor. I know that. And so I said, you're my pastor. And I think I want to go to this conference. I think I want to seek them out and go to this, con ask them if I'm allowed to come. And I want to go to this conference and I want to see these people. And so he said to me, you know, Kathy, there's a voice crying in the wilderness and I can't hear it. He said, but I think you might be able to hear it. And so right then he committed to airfare, hotel and registration for me. But afterwards it came out that what he was hoping I was hearing was that there were gay Christians and that maybe I was hearing the voice to go like after them to bring them back into the church. Like he was hearing, he couldn't have said the words like reparative therapy or exodus, but to pursue them, to bring them back to Jesus. That's not what I was thinking. And that's not what I thought he was thinking. There's an agenda to recapture and bring back into the fold through reparative therapy, counseling, ministry, Holy Spirit, whatever it is, we, we're going to recapture these lost sheep from the church. That There was an agenda there. Your By agenda, him. Your agenda was very different. It was... I'm not sure I had an agenda. It was absolute curiosity. I could not imagine that this was real. And so then my next step was um, to talk to my boss at work. I was a technology salesperson. And beginning of the year, you're supposed to set out all your goals for the year. And I was his top salesperson. And so I had to project all my goals, you know, the first week of January. And I said to him, I need, I need to leave on a third. It was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I think maybe Sunday morning. So I needed two days off from work. And I said, if I can get my goals done, and they were also Christian owners. So I was going to have to say to my very Christian bosses, I want to go to a gay Christian conference. That's what I want to do. I don't want to go snowboarding. I want to go to a gay Christian conference. So I had to that hurdle. And they both looked at me like, we know, they knew since the moment they hired me that I was a devout Christian. And they, especially the wife, who is to this day a friend of mine, 
and very supportive of the work I do. N not quite understanding at the time, but they knew that I was a woman pursuing God. And they believed that there was something in this that was really spiritually driving me. And they approved of my time off. Just get your, you know, get your numbers done for next year. So I remember still on the plane, finishing up my spreadsheets, flying into Seattle and going into Seattle. And my only, my only motivation was, does this really is, exist? How am I hanging out for five years with gay people, not heard about gay Christians? I mean, and they're organized and they're having a conference it was beyond my rational thinking, and I just had to go see what this was about. No desire to change anybody. The entire desire was to go see, is this real? That's it. So driven by curiosity, and when That's was it. this, when was the conference? December, that was, that was January 2008. Okay. So you've been <coughs> studying the Italian with Thomas. You've been walking the trails with Neto. You're sitting in all of this dissonance. And then New York Times, there it is. And curiosity gets the best of you. You secure the permissions. And you walk into even greater dissonance. So something funny, one thing I want to back up and say, I knew something was happening years before, but I didn't know where it was going. I remember when Tom and, so this is backtracking actually several years, but I remember when Tom and Neto walked into my life in the same month and thinking, and this is really unusual, that a gay man and a lesbian like come into my world and I quick friends with them. And then there was a woman's retreat and boy, do I not like women's retreats. Um, I don't like the craft time of women's retreats. I wish we had book review hour. I don't know. I don't like craft time. And so um, women's retreat of the church, of the pastor that would eventually allow me to go. And, um, you know, the, so at the last day of women's retreats, the Sunday morning, you're all packing up to go home and you all gather in the room and you all say what God has told you this weekend. And typically all the God told you this weekend things always have to do with people's husbands. You know, I'm going to be a better wife. I mean, all of that stuff. And well, you know, I was by then didn't have a husband to be a better wife to. I was already separated. <clears throat> and people knew I was very outspoken within my church, very visible, very friendly. And um, I was the last one that hadn't spoken. And it was like all eyes on me, like, what's she going to say? Like, when is she going to stand up? So I, I got up kind of frustrated because I didn't have a husband to blame my ills on. And so I stood up and I said, I have something to say. Hmm, I, should have, I shouldn't have even stood up. No, I did. So I stood up and I said, okay, I don't know what any of this means. But in the recent, in the very recent time, God has dropped two people into my life. I said, this lesbian just drops into my life on a hiking trail. This gay man just drops into my world in an Italian class. And I said, God is up to something in my world, which you can imagine is making these evangelical women very uncomfortable. So, and I could see that they're very uncomfortable. And I said, and I don't know what's going on, but I put my hands up in the air and I said, God, Whatever you're doing in my life, I am so open to it. Bring it on. And then I looked and I said, and I don't give a rat's ass what any of you think about it. And then I sat down. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what it meant. So back to ballsy, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Yeah. So then I go to yeah. this conference. The next thing I did after check with my pastor, check with my boss. I called Justin Lee. I found the offices in Raleigh, North Carolina. I called him up and I said, I read the article in the New York Times. This is who I am. I'm like a nobody, but I'm really curious. And I said to him, I just want to come look at you. I want to come see you. Like, 
gay Christians in the wild. And so he said, yeah, you can come. He didn't put any qualifiers on me, like you can't come to do this. I think he heard my genuineness. And so I went. So the very first gay Christian that I knew of that I ever met was Justin Lee. And um, I didn't go in there announcing I was straight. I tried to stay background, but Justin, you know, knew who I was. It was a nobody, but he knew I was straight and curious. And so he took me um, to a few key luncheons where I got to sit with some very important people. And then my curiosity wanted me to sit with like the lesbian couple that were leading worship. Like, I have to hear your story. I have to hear your story. I, I was so intentional about hearing stories all weekend that I was probably the most extroverted person there, like connecting with more people than anybody. And when I left there, but the very first night of worship, Thursday night, it was in um, like a Holiday Inn in Renton, south of Seattle. And uh, not a very big banquet room. And when they started playing the music in a darkened room, I felt the spirit of God that I felt in churches. I wouldn't have called them straight churches. I felt the spirit of God that I felt in church. And I thought, how is this even possible? How is it that these people are worshiping the same God that I worship? And I feel the Holy Spirit, how is this possible? So I went to the back of the room and I thought, man, Kathy, you are in the weirdest spot imaginable. You better like take pictures with your eyes because people don't see this, people don't know this, and you are, what, you're here. So I walked in the back of the room and saw all these raised hands. And I, um, I knew it was holy. And I, I actually took my boots off and laid them by the, the wall and got down on my knees and laid, you know, in child's pose, <laughs> you know, child's pose on the floor and just cried and thought, how oh, is this possible? that these people are Christians. And I came home and um, the man I had been in a seven year, six year relationship with that I was intending to marry was not happy with my friendships with gay people. Very macho man, um, born in Bolivia, 14 years older, very successful um, career, highly successful career in law enforcement in one of the agencies subject of documentaries a man's man so you put all those things together and this is a man that values his masculinity yeah. and all of a sudden i think that gay people are okay and so um i'm going to be blunt about what he's he did he the next day we went to the gym together in the early morning and he introduced me to somebody he was so upset that i'd gone to this thing you know, not with his permission, certainly. He was so upset that I went to this that he actually introduced me to someone that was new to the gym. And this is how he said, this is Kathy. She thinks she knows more than the Pope and she thinks that gay sex, gay anal sex is okay. That's how he introduced me to a person. And I thought, there are so many things to say about me, and that's what you lead with? So I kept my mouth shut, and I went to work, and on the way home from work the next day, called him, and I said, can I come by your house for dinner? He said, yes. And I stopped by his house, and I ended a six-year relationship because everything inside of me said, you've got a choice to make. You can go after a passion or a person. And I, and I knew that either choice I made was not a wrong choice. I knew I really had a choice. So it wasn't go down this path and it's bad and go down this path and it's good. I knew I had a choice. And 
knowing nothing. And I knew nothing except for that experience less than five days before. That's all I knew. And I went and I said to him, I think I have a different direction to go in my life. And I don't think I can go with you in my life. And I'm ending this relationship. It was shocking to both of us that I did that. But that's pretty deep conviction. That's, there's no logic associated with this one. That was a, um, I don't know what kind of decision that was. It was unusual, that I know. God must have been talking to me really strong to get me to do these things as a single, I mean, if I had married him, we'll say his name, I would be even financially set for life. I would have been reputation-wise set for life. Senators and Congress people still called him for his opinions on the issues he was involved in. I could have had reputation, high status, money, house right between the canyons where, and I go and I say, I'm done because I think there's something over here. Who really does that? I mean, to this day, I don't know why I did that. There was a convergence of so many things. Um, this was part one. Thank you, listeners. Join us next time where we're going to continue part two of this interview with Kathy Baldock. <laughs>